Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So we have a session on optimization for the next hour. And we have uh, three speakers that uh, represent uh, uh, roughly three generations over various going by graduation time. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> also, different interests uh, from discrete to continuous and in between. And I'm looking forward. So the, the structure is every speaker will speak for about 10 to 12 minutes. We hope we'll have 30 minutes in the end. Please prepare your questions, and uh, I will try to facilitate them. The first speaker is Dan Binstock. Dan graduated from the OR Center in the early, early 80s, uh, even before me. And uh, <laughs> mid 80s. <laughs> Very good. And uh, so Dan, uh, uh, in a very distinguished career, he has been a professor at Columbia who are from the beginning until now. Dan? Thank you, Dimitris. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, this is a very special place to me. Uh, the education I got here has served me very well. And by education, I mean more, much more than just the courses that I took here, general immersion to MIT, and the uh, philosophy of the OR Center. Um, and I'm very pleased to be here. Um, uh, Dimitris gave us some uh, very specific instructions, which I will partially obey. Uh, what do you expect? <laughs> the, uh, although the instructions, I think, are very good, uh, the, uh, uh, um, they are spot on. Uh, his instructions were to talk on a topic, on a topic that, on a non-technical topic that we think will be of importance to the OR community moving forward, and I think that's a very good thing. And of course, I will partly disobey it by beginning to talk on, on a, uh, a fairly narrow but very important uh, technical topic from a very high level, from a very high level perspective. Uh, although uh, what I'm discussing is something that goes against to some extent goes against the grain of optimization. Um, in recent years, I've been involved in problems, mostly optimization problems related to the operation of power grids. Um, and uh, uh, these are very nasty problems. These are continuous optimization problems with uh, non-convex constraints, uh, usually uh, uh, bilinear constraints. Uh, the quantity to be optimized is also uh, uh, bilinear. Um, and uh, the point I want to make is that uh, um, traditional optimization with its focus on, the, uh, let's say, precise optimization is probably the wrong tool to address these problems for many reasons. Uh, first of all, the, the models themselves, and not only the models themselves, but the, the, uh, the data uh, represent uh, abstractions of very complex physics. Um, there's no point in needlessly uh, exploiting every single bit uh, this is all low level, as I, as I uh, uh, told you in advance. Um, um, moreover, because it, it is uh, uh, non-convex constraints, uh, uh, there are artifacts that will be uh, developed if you actually solve a problem to optimality. Uh, irrational solutions, uh, isolated points, and so on. All of these are, uh, would have an important practical impact if you really do want to optimize it. You probably get the wrong point. Um, and so this would ask for some version of robustness, perhaps, although, of course, uh, given that we have non-convex constraints, then this starts to become very complex. Uh, however, the main point is that from a practical perspective, what the engineers want is they want good solutions very quickly. Uh, these are problems that are solved operationally. You don't have hours. Uh, the problems involve many thousands of variables. Uh, the state of the art and a more or less exact solution requires hours to solve much smaller problems. Uh, what is really needed is a, 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 a technology that is based on good optimization, good mathematics, for computing good solutions uh, without making any claims as to the quality of the solutions. You'll get local optima. Uh, now, this sounds uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, revolutionary or going against the grain, but you, know, you can still have a very good algorithm that computes local solutions. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, Many of the improvements in integer programming in recent years were done just along those lines. Um, 
And uh, what is the king of the hill right now in terms of software for computing good solutions? It's uh, logarithmic barrier methods, uh, which are very fickle. Uh, logarithmic barrier methods may fail to converge. You run it and it says, sorry, it cannot converge. And, uh, or I converge to a bad point. Um, and uh, moreover, if you start imposing conditions to try to achieve the kind of robustness that I alluded to before, then they really fail to converge. Um, I would like to develop something that is based on, uh, well, actually exploiting the bilinear structure, something first order. Uh, after all, people working on machine learning use first order method to address problems that are not too distant from, uh, uh, from this kind of problem. Training a deep network is exactly this sort of problem. Um, of course, they don't make any claims whatsoever as to global optimality. They never do. They just run it. In fact, if you tell them you want to compute the optimum, they might say, well, that's bad because that'll amount to overfitting. So don't do that, please. Um, uh, however, in the engineering domain, these are not massively large problems. The problems they may, mainly involve thousands of variables. They still totally outstrip the capability of what we can do today. So local optima based on good mathematics uh, robust solutions for bilinear problems, first order methods, uh, no guarantees of optimality, no guarantees of gaps. Um, that would be very useful in the practice. Um, I should add that there's an ongoing competition run by the Department of Energy for solving these uh, power flow problems. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what comes out. All right, uh, this, is the, this was the pseudo technical part of the talk. Uh, and I have, how much do I have now? Oh, five minutes, that's not bad. So here's the important, what I regard to be an important topic for OR and for optimization. It's something that the optimization community has shied away from for a long time, many decades, something that is long overdue. Uh, uh, now, one thing that we are all aware that is happening is that there are other technical mathematical communities that are in close intellectual proximity to both OR and optimization and who are stealing the limelight and the jobs and the funding and so on away from optimization and OR. Um, these communities, as well as most engineering communities, have a, a, a hidden um, ace up their sleeves, a hidden uh, uh, asset that they rely on extensively and which the OR community and the optimization community has stayed away from for, I would argue, bad reasons. They have this notion of the refereed conference. The refereed conference, or I should say refereed conferences, because each community has multiple such conferences every year, um, are a quality venue. They, they recognize that they view it as a quality venue that um, publishes research, usually in an early form, uh, after a rapid review. Uh, if you are a researcher in one of these fields and you're active in one of these fields, you can count of, on three or four publications in the span of one year. Uh, this is in contrast with what is done in particular in the optimization community where, first of all, just writing the paper will probably take at least one year and the review process might take two, three years. Uh, this is not a timely publication schedule it hurts all of us at all levels of seniority, and it hurts in particular the junior people the most. Um, notice what I'm advocating for is such conferences not as a substitute to our journals. The journals should remain. They should publish completed uh, works. Uh, the refereeing standard should not change. Uh, well, with one asterisk I'll get to in a minute. Uh, the uh, conferences are just a, 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 an, an addendum, uh, a venue for producing early research, um, uh, not completed research. These are ideas, uh, perhaps a theorem, uh, not necessarily a complete paper. Now, in this context, there's a, um, an opinion in the optimization community uh, where explicitly people say that they want optimization papers to be perfect. Um, that may be, uh, that term has been used uh, in discussions with me explicitly. People look for perfect papers. And indeed, if you submit to the top journals, you will run into referees that will criticize everything from the font set to use to the citation style, table headings. Uh, uh, you get comments upon comments which are uh, irrelevant to the uh, subject matter. 
to the new idea. So a perfect paper is not necessarily the best venue for communicating a new idea. That's my point. A new idea is a new idea which may be imperfect. It may even be wrong. I'm not advocating for publishing a false theorem. I'm saying that somebody may come up with an algorithmic idea that upon repeated study, experimental study is shown not to be good. That's OK. That's all right. This is what science is about. Um, another uh, um, way of rejecting uh, um, these conferences is that the quality is low. Well, this is, this is a joke. I'm sorry to put it this way. In the theoretical computer science venues, uh, there have been exceptional quality results that came out in those conferences first, published by first-rank mathematicians, Lovas, other Babai, other Hungarians, uh, Noga Lon, and so on. The list goes on and on. The quality is not low. Of course, they can publish papers with mistakes, but so do the journals. Um, and lately, of course, in the machine learning setting, uh, uh, pretty much everybody in the nonlinear programming world is scrambling to publish in their conferences, ICML, NIPS, and so on. Uh, uh, people who have received awards at ISMP have had pretty much their entire publication record come out in such conferences. And they are fine with that. Uh, these are fast-moving communities. Communication of, uh, rapid communication of ideas is essential. Um, another uh, um, uh, um, obstacle that has been thrown in front of this idea, one minute, is that mathematicians don't do that. Well, that's wrong. Uh, uh, mathematicians do that, as, as I just uh, uh, described. Uh, yet another plus for such conferences, there, there are two pluses. Well, one plus is that they give awards uh, best paper, two best papers, and so on. And junior people uh, uh, put this on their CVs. I'm, you know, like many of you, I'm on, on uh, uh, promotion committees at different universities. As you can see that engineers will list, engineers including machine learning people, will list all their best papers at this conference and that. Or people and optimization people do not have that possibility, they just don't have it. It's not available, unless, of course, they go to somebody else's conference. Uh, the final uh, positive attribute that the conferences have is that the committees, the, the program committees that, that, that select the papers, uh, are mostly made up of younger individuals, number one, and number two, the committees change. Every conference is a new committee. This is a feature that the journals simply cannot match, and it's a, a, a source of great renewal for such communities. They, uh, you go participate in a committee and you come back to your department, you bring a lot. Uh, just a much broader viewpoint. Uh, uh, it's a source for new ideas and so on and so forth. And now I will stop. Thank you. Yeah. We have questions afterwards. Afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. So our second speaker is Adam Agelbaum, uh, graduated from uh, the OR Center in the 2000, recently, 2010s. And Adam will talk about contextual optimization. Okay, so, Professor um, at Columbia. Yes, so um, thank you so much for uh, being here. I am, uh, I feel like I'm in one of those cartoons, like which one does not belong? I, I really don't know. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm honored anyways to, to, to give you my perspective on, on optimization. There are um, 50 people here who could um, be here as well, so um, I won't take this lightly. So um, in my thesis, I worked with Ratsev and um, I studied problems um, in revenue uh, and supply chain management from a very theoretical aspect. But uh, during my time at MIT, I was influenced a lot by people here, um, people on this panel, and even my uh, uh, RedSaf as well. We had spent time looking at data from um, pharmaceutical industry and things like that. So in the back of my mind, although my thesis was in one area, I was always thinking about other problems. So this is really a message to other PhD students, just because you work on something in your thesis doesn't mean you have to do that exclusively the rest of your life, although I still work on things related to my thesis, of course, and in this context. So what I'm talking about today, um, for a lack of a better title, I don't know if this is the best title for this, but I call it contextual optimization. And this is um, sort of a set of problems where I want to solve some optimization problem many, many times, but each time I solve it, the information I have is slightly different. So, and that information I'm going to call a context. 
So sometimes we call this personalized optimization, but it doesn't always have to be a person. It could be a business or a product or a location, for example. Um, and um, a, lot of the, a lot of the issues have come up from uh, collaborations I have with various um, partnerships and um, all kinds of things like nonprofit advertising, aviation, and so on. So these problems arise everywhere. Um, <clears throat> so let me, I guess, just explain um, well, a little bit what I mean about this. And I think this is, um, although I can't talk about what the future of R is, but I can tell you that this is one area that I think is growing and a lot of people here are working on. Um, so contextual optimization, like I said, is a problem you know, um, that has some common characteristics. I'm not gonna formally define it. I was, we were told to be non-technical, but I don't think we need to be technical anyways. So it's a problem you're gonna solve many times. And each time you solve it, like I said, there's some context in which you solve it, okay? And the key characteristic is that every time you're gonna solve this problem, there are some unknown parameters in your model that I need to estimate from data. And this represents pretty much any real world optimization problem, okay? And um, how am I gonna estimate those unknown parameters? It's gonna be from some historical data. I'm gonna use that historical data to, to train some model or use as an input. And then given my new context that represents my current instance, I'm gonna apply um, my historical data and my model and use that to solve my optimization problem. So it's a very broad concept. I'm gonna give a concrete examples in, in just a second. But the key thing here is that we want to measure the quality of the decision we make based on the optimization context, okay? So um, as opposed to maybe machine learning where we're not thinking necessarily about decisions exactly, but maybe more something about prediction quality, okay? So um, getting back to my thesis, this is actually a picture from the, on the bottom from the very first talk I gave, uh, probably like 10 years ago. Um, Here's a, here's a famous uh, problem in inventory management called the economic lot sizing problem. We have a sequence of demands, okay, and you need to satisfy all these demands by a sequence of orders, and you're trying to minimize some combination of ordering costs and holding costs, and this is um, a very well-known model used by in many, many settings. But a key input into this model is the demand forecast for every period, and typically we just assume it's known. But that's actually something we need to estimate from data, and that the context you have in that situation are uh, many things like the seasonality, previous order history, manager expertise, similar product sales, and so on. So those are the contexts you would have when you come up with those forecasts. And the key is you wanna design forecasts that lead to good production schedules, okay? Another example is the shortest path problem, another fundamental problem where I'm trying to get someone um, from point A to point B as fast as possible. And um, to, in order to do that, I need to know the costs on my network. Okay, we always assume CIJ is given, but that has to come from somewhere. Okay, so we have to estimate those costs on the network, and what, are the, what is the context in those situations? It's the time of day, it's the traffic patterns, the speed limit, and all sorts of data and GPS information you can collect. So that's the context in those settings, okay? And the goal is, not necessarily to predict the travel times, but to get the user from point A to point B as fast as possible, okay? That's the real direct goal, it's a decision. And just another quick example, if, you're, if I'm building a portfolio, um, I may have, uh, my context here might be so, sort of social media data or historical returns, news information, economic indicators that help me predict the returns on my assets. I need to design some portfolio based on my contacts and historical data that um, trades off my risk and return um, in an ideal way. Okay, so um, here's, that's just sort of a brief introduction. Even in very foundational problems where we always assume these parameters are known, really there's some underlying context that we use to predict um, this information. So I'm gonna channel sort of a little bit of Dimitris here and make this sort of statement, um, the goal in all these settings is not to make good predictions using machine learning, it's actually to make good decisions, or great decisions, as it says here. Um, and that's actually really important to make that distinction, because one thing I've learned from sort of being in this area is that I think actually making decisions is often easier than making predictions. And you can leverage that insight and come up with better algorithms than you could by just sort of naively applying machine learning algorithms. 
So um, maybe this is a little bit uh, um, not exact to say or not proper to say, but perhaps one could believe that an optimization task is easier than the prediction task. And the way to think about that, if, if that doesn't make sense to you, is, well, if I could predict everything perfectly, if I knew everything exactly, then the optimization task would be easy. But if I made the correct decision, it doesn't necessarily mean I would have known what the right prediction values are. Okay? So one implies the other. So if I can predict perfectly, I can optimize perfectly. But if I can optimize perfectly, it doesn't mean I can predict the parameters perfectly. Okay. And the other aspect is that usually the dimension of the problem for optimization is actually lower. So the number of feasible outcomes in reality are a lot lower. There may be only three realistic paths I want to take from point A to point B, but I might have to estimate hundreds of edges on the network. Okay, so how do we, how do we sort of leverage this stuff? So what should we do for these contextual optimization problems? I think this is a huge um, um, area for research and, um, and very important for industry as well. One observation, though, is that if your data is very rich, like you actually have a lot of samples compared to the size of your features, I do think actual machine learning black box techniques are going to work really well. But as was mentioned earlier today, that's often not actually the case. So you need to do something um, fancier. And even if, you, even if you are in this setting, you have to be careful and really consider your optimization problem appropriately. So. Um, one really nice idea from um, Dimitris and, and Nathan Callas is um, by looking at when you're solving nonlinear optimization problems, for instance, and you need to estimate some of these parameters, you really have to take the nonlinear into account. It doesn't make sense to plug in a point prediction if you're solving a nonlinear problem because expectation does not compute, uh, commute in a function. Okay? You lose something by just plugging in a point prediction. So, um, there's a nice sort of line of work here that looks at how can we take the knowledge that we get from machine learning algorithms, some weights from some very popular techniques, and apply them in the right way in the context of our optimization problem. Okay, and those, those ideas seem to work really well. Um, there's another line of work starting back from almost 10 years ago, trying to train machine learning models that directly account for the problem you want to solve. Okay. So rather than thinking about like the mean squared error of the edges of the travel times on the network, why don't we just think about the actual um, optimal path in the network as our as our um, metric for loss? So as long as we get someone on the right path, we should incur zero loss. It doesn't matter what we predicted for the edges. So this is what we mean by a decision loss. So why not train like a linear model or a decision tree directly with respect to the decision we want to do? Okay, so there's some uh, mathematical challenges in that, but there, are, there has been some progress made in this area. Um, and there's many other things, I think, going on right now. These are just two streams that um, I know of well, comfortable enough to speak about at least. Um, so really, that's, that's most of what I have to say. And I just want to say this is, uh, there's many open and exciting areas in this, in this space. And um, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you, Adam. Our first speaker is uh, Asu Ozaklar. Asu is almost from the OR Center, uh, <laughs> a distinguished faculty and uh, the care and uh, chair of uh, ECS department who teaches uh, many of our optimization courses over many years. Asu? Thank you. And my slides will go automatically, yep, I, I hope. presume? Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you very much for including me. Uh, as Dimitris mentioned, unfortunately, I'm not an ORC graduate. Uh, I was uh, a, a graduate student at LITS. I was always envious uh, of my um, yeah, ORC uh, students at the time. I always hung out with them. I became sort of like a, a step uh, child sister. Uh, and uh, I would like you to note that uh, that group that I was part of actually 
became my professional social network as I sort of moved uh, in my career as well as life. And I still basically, uh, those are the closest uh, points of contact for me. Uh, at the time, Lids was not as uh, uh, sort of a uh, close community. Uh, was, things were much more isolated when I was a student. And I'm not going to say how long ago, although they just gave it out by saying I'm in the middle generation, which was hard to get. <laughs> I'm still No, I consider you in the young. Uh... Oh, good. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, but I mean, the new generation said something like a talk I gave 10 years ago, and I was like, oh, OK. Uh, uh. Anyway, so uh, I think LITS has changed a lot. Uh, so it became a community very similar to RC. I feel those two uh, uh, very sister uh, communities and uh, those that sort of interact a lot uh, and a lot of synergies in, in between. One coming more from an engineering perspective. I think ORC is broad, uh, combines uh, many different perspectives. So Dimitris asked me, uh, as Dan pointed out, uh, very specific directions, non-technical talk. So that's very hard for me, but I will try. Uh, so so as well as you know, future directions uh, that I find interesting and important for optimization and ORC moving forward. I feel several of these directions are in the context of large scale systems, clearly a biased view. There's a lot going on. But I'll try to give you a couple of ideas or interesting directions uh, that are sort of in this large scale system space. Uh, oh, oh, I see. This There's is a green clicker, button. the green button. Yeah. Yep. Green button, perfect. OK, dream button. So this is actually a very uh, sort of motivation slide. I feel uh, optimization is such a powerful uh, technology, methodology, with great impact in many applications. And what I did here is basically put applications that are more engineering focused as well as more business related. Uh, so uh, data networks clearly uh, was big in LIDs 20, 30 years ago. Signal image processing is uh, very important in electrical engineering, computer science, communication, transmitter receiver design. These are all problems in which optimization is core. But also in manufacturing, supply chain, revenue management, financial engineering. And I would like to, I think the point I would like to make here is ORC is playing such an important role at MIT, bringing both these engineering applications as well as business applications in one place. And uh, so uh, in terms of moving forward with large scale systems, I like to contrast traditional approach with what the modern systems pose as challenges. If you look at optimization, uh, continuous optimization, uh, maybe 20 years ago, we basically look at the uh, approach being sort of information centralized, moderate to large problem sizes. There's a single optimization objective that we're trying to achieve. In the context of data networks, we would like to sort of find routing or resource allocation to minimize total congestion. If you look at modern systems, things have changed quite a bit. That's not how we sort of uh, impose questions uh, or how we uh, formulate questions in this setting. Information is very decentralized, so systems look like this. Uh, we're thinking about you know, uh, connecting many, many sensors, collecting decentralized information, connecting many, many individuals with very different heterogeneous requirements, all holding local information. We have access to large, large data. So this sort of uh, advances in both online platforms as well as automated markets led to large data sets, very large problem sizes. So we're thinking about now text classification problems with dimensions 10 to the 8. So very large problem sizes. And uh, Dan mentioned this. If you look at many of the systems, this idea of we're actually just dealing with a single objective doesn't really hold anymore. A good example is a smart grid system, which consists of competing generators on one side, transmission lines controlled by ISOs, distribution networks uh, controlled by utility companies, but also interestingly uh, from the demand side, consumer side, uh, actively participating in this market through demand ma management mechanisms, direct indirect load control. So this is basically looking much more like a market as opposed to a single optimization uh, objective. So these considerations, I think, motivate uh, at least you know, uh, one branch of optimization, the following critical directions. The first one is thinking about very fast and scalable algorithms for large-scale optimization. Uh, the other one is decentralized optimization over physical systems, where you have local information. And the third one, uh, which, of course, uh, 
is very uh, central to my own research is thinking about the human element, the role of the human element, strategic decisions, and its uh, interaction with the underlying engineered infrastructure, which is what we call the game theory. So I'll try to give a couple of ideas, uh, progress in these uh, sort of uh, different areas over the past uh, decade or so, and try to sort of pose some uh, questions moving forward. So large-scale optimization, I think, is very important. Uh, this is uh, motivated both by decisions in large-scale systems as well as large-scale data processing, I will mostly be focusing on the latter. The large-scale systems, there's a lot of research in ORC uh, focusing on integer aspects, integer programming, network optimization. There's some beautiful work that's done by Dimitris, uh, Patrick, Sebastian, thinking about, uh, I don't know if Sebastian is here, but thinking about very large-scale transportation systems and thinking about decisions in that context. I'll mainly focus on the data processing. And clearly, uh, we have a lot of data. Uh, Data sets are very large. These are consisting of hundreds of millions, billions of data points, and it's very high dimensional. We have access to very detailed information about each of the examples or features we uh, receive. Uh, as well as also, because of the size, we think about storing as well as uh, uh, collecting them in a decentralized manner, which I will return back in a, a few minutes. So here is one sort of point uh, that I would like to make, sort of a, a move in optimization, uh, changing the focus from very sophisticated algorithms, interior point methods and others, to very simple algorithms. So we're now looking at algorithms that are gradient-based, first order, Frank Wolf, coordinate descent, to be able to address these questions. And the reason we like these algorithms is they involve very simple computations. And they have running times which have very mild dimension dependence to be able to deal with this large scale of the problems. And uh, these problems also have structure. In particular, we're not just minimizing a cost, but an additive cost. And uh, what does that additive cost represent? Uh, this is basically sum over fi's, which are generally loss functions associated with a data point or a data block. And m is typically the size of the data set. So you see there immediately the large m emerging. This is basically sum of very large number of uh, component functions. A very classical example is uh, the empirical risk minimization framework from machine learning whereby uh, we have some supervised uh, learning problem. We have some data, uh, collection of data points, AI, YI. AI are our future vectors. YI are the target levels, uh, I from 1 to M. And we're trying to learn an input out, unknown input-output relation from data. And many of these problems are formulated as a empirical risk minimization problem, whereby we basically think about uh, minimizing a loss function averaged over the data. Here, the x's are the parameters of the model that we're trying to learn, plus some penalty on the complexity of the model. Think about this as an L2 norm, L1 norm. And as you see, this is exactly the structure I was referring to. And examples are many. Lasso, support vector machines, regression problems, classification, all take this form. So how do we solve this problem? I mentioned gradient methods. Uh, uh, sort of to be able to deal with this uh, large scale. But if you think about just applying a single gradient step to this problem, you have to compute the full gradient, right? Gradient of the cost function f, which is the gradient of the, each of the fi's. Uh, so even a gradient step involves basically us touching all of these data points. And that's not very feasible, very costly. So this motivated an incredible interest on what I call an incremental algorithm. Uh, this is basically processing the component functions one at a time. Instead of getting the whole F and working with it, let me actually exploit the additive structure. So that's what optimization people call these algorithms, incremental methods. These go back to 70s, 80s. But machine learning people call it stochastic gradient descent. Uh, it's the same thing. Uh, one is actually a, a, a subcase in which we do some part of some kind of randomization. And this is superbly popular. This is basically the most widely used algorithm in machine learning practice since the 50s. It's now the default method for data analysis, increasing importance because of training uh, neural networks. Uh, uh, so this has become uh, created uh, a sort of act quite a bit of activity in continuous optimization to be able to understand the properties of this method as well as its variants. Beautiful ideas have come up uh, in the last, uh, let's say, eight years or so, seven, eight years. And I will just sort of uh, tell you the abbreviations. 
I don't, I mean, I can tell you what the, these stand for, but I think many people know these by the abbreviations. These are sort of under the broad umbrella of variance reduced methods, SAG, SAGA, SVRG, STCA. Uh, Truly beautiful ideas from continuous optimization perspective. So essentially, I have a figure there that shows their performance. So the gradient deterministic methods have the behavior, uh, which is sort of nice but slow. Stochastic methods move fast progress, but then sort of stall. So the idea was, can we actually come up with something that beats both of them? And that's what sort of the idea of SAG, uh, this sort of allows using incremental steps uh, to be able to move fast. But because this incremental steps inc introduces a lot of noise, uh, you also want to sort of come up with some mechanisms to be able to reduce the variance of that noise, which allows you to make very fast progress. So much progress, a lot of ideas coming up, yet all of the theory is for convex case. And uh, again, Dan just mentioned that while this is great, beautiful from a mathematical perspective, none of the things we're solving, we're trying to solve has that convex structure. So what do we do in the non-convex case? Again, a very active area of research. Uh, a lot of interesting ideas coming up. How do we escape saddle points? How, what can we say about the landscape of these optimization problems? Can we say something about you know, op approximate optimality properties of the local minima here? Can we hope to get any kind of theoretical understanding? So this is, I think we're still at the beginnings of, uh, we're scratching the iceberg, but there's a lot of things, uh, a lot of ideas to be discovered in that context. So related to that, let me also talk a little bit about distributed optimization. I feel like this is an area which is much more uh, prominent in engineering, in particular if you look at control uh, CDC communities, conferences, there's a lot of activity going on in here. And the idea is in many applications, if you're thinking about data processing, data is stored, collected decentralized way. Resource allocation, you have to do it in a uh, way which is sort of uses only local information. And if you look at the problem formulation, it takes a very similar form to what I just talked about. Think about now FIs corresponding to some objective functions associated with each of these decentralized agents. You can also have constraints associated with their connectivity structure. So the point is these FIs are just locally known by the agents, and now we have a new twist on top of optimization. You have to basically design algorithms which can work with the underlying connectivity structure, meaning you can't talk to everybody. I can only talk to Patrick, Patrick can only talk to Tom, and so on. So now this is another beautiful area where you look at the graph properties, optimization properties, and see what kind of complexity estimates? What kind of algorithms can you design? Can you match the uh, complexity estimates of centralized algorithms? What should you exchange? What is the communication complexity? What's the computational complexity? And uh, many of the times, okay, two minutes, uh, a lot of interesting questions, a lot of very beautiful continuous algorithms. I talk fast now, I'm going to even talk faster. Oh, but there's a lot of stuff that sort <laughs> of goes like. on in terms of resilience, robustness, adversarial behavior. That's another one that uh, a lot of us are interested in. We assume these optimization uh, problems uh, work in a vacuum. That's not the case. We have adversarial uh, uh, effects. How do we uh, think about optimization algorithms that can work in the presence of adversaries, misspecified optim optimization objectives, uh, uh, as well as network topology? So let me end up by the, this one, which I feel like another very important direction for OR, and that's basically I've already alluded to some of this, but in many systems we have uh, very much uh, autonomous human decisions playing hand in hand with the optimization objectives. The other one which I find uh, truly interesting and not explored so far is that we're talking about data processing, we're talking about game theory, but there's also the fact that when we're trying to process this data, this data is actually social data. It's generated by people. So if you're thinking about, for instance, matrix completion problems or you know estimation problems, you should be cognizant of the fact that this data has biases in them because they're generated by humans. So that's one aspect. The other one is uh, we're also thinking about large-scale systems, human objectives, and uh, the analysis of interactions in the small is what game theory uh, addresses. But we're not talking about that here. The systems we have are large-scale. Game theory does not help us address how do we find equilibrium here, how do we characterize equilibrium, what is equilibrium here, how does it interact with the underlying uh, engineering infrastructure. So I feel like uh, we have a lot to say as uh, the OR community about such interactions in the large, how does it intersect with constraint optimization objectives. And let me end by just giving a couple of quick examples. 
uh, I think some examples of great interest is in these large scale systems, can we think about how information plays a role? Uh, and this is something uh, Saurabh also works quite a bit on. Uh, we've we are thinking about incentives to change behavior in these large scale systems. Thanks to the online platforms, now we have much more leverage. We have a, they have a cyber layer information that we can control. So how do we think about designing information in traffic and related systems? How do we think about optimization problems in these societal uh, problems, transportation systems? Think about shared economies, optimization in the context of shared economy models. Many, many uh, very exciting uh, questions and areas that OR can actually play a big role in. So with that, let's Thank you. Thank you. So we have about uh, 20 minutes for questions. I will open it by one question for all of you. Dan, do you mind being coming? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> all of you have spoken about the future. So, uh, so if you look at the R Center history for the last 30 years, we have uh, a sequence of classes that have always been of uh, taught uh, high quality. I can say that because they were before me. And uh, we have added some things, but fundamentally we have not changed. In other words, we teach uh, linear optimization, or linear optimization, discrete optimization. We have added dynamic programming. Uh, recently, we have added robust optimizations and a few others. So, but fundamentally, should we change? In other words, uh, if do you feel we, from your experiences both here and at other places, do you feel that the teaching of optimization to our students at the graduate level is, is in need of change? Anyone? I would say no. no um, you have to start somewhere. Uh, People do not, on, on the whole, people do not learn optimization in their undergraduate education. Um, my guess is that even though you have courses by those names, that what actually is taught is different than it was, let's say, 30 years ago. And, um, and the changes probably are, are for the good. So I think that, that having the courses, but uh, uh, adjusting what is taught um, is the right way to go for the foreseeable future. That would be my guess. So gradual. Gradual, yeah. yes. Uh, I actually agree completely. We should not change. I strongly believe in fundamentals, and I feel like ORC has such a strong program in being able to you know, cl have clearly defined fundamentals, so I strongly believe in those. But I also want to echo that what we teach in those in addition to the fundamentals, maybe some other, you know, focus topics change over time. So, for instance, nonlinear programming. Uh, when we did this 10, 15 years ago, uh, there are the fundamentals, but also we put emphasis on uh, some of the algorithms of the time. Whereas now, there's quite a bit of interest in thinking about, you know, machine learning algorithms, ex emphasizing some some of the new developments. So, I think. I would say stick to fundamentals, but maybe include some of the recent developments to be able to create research directions. David? Can I ask a follow-up? I'm just curious to read your opinion on the role of actual hands-on computing within the context of such classes. I mean, is it so you talk about foundation methodological courses, mm -hmm. and I would conjecture that that, that that may not be the direction of safe football, maybe it has. Mm -hmm. But I just wondering, as you think about it, is that a matter of I personally think that we, should, we everybody should be capable of doing some computing, solve a problem, and so on. I, I mean, when I was a student, it was taken for granted that we would be able to do so, and several courses would give us assignments without asking first, oh, can you write a program? You know, they would say, do this. Um, and we should be able to do this. I think uh, 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 OR people doing optimization uh, are not exactly the same thing as a pure mathematician doing mathematics, even though we, many of us appreciate pure mathematics. We, we may even submit our papers to their conferences, but that's not exactly who we are. We should be able to address actual data and do analyses and so on. Uh, of course, what, is it, what it is that, that we do may change. You know, how we program today is not the same as how we programmed 40 years ago, let's say. But, uh, but the hands-on uh, um, um, interaction with data and uh, algorithms and so on, I think, is invaluable. Adam? 
Yeah, I, I do think we should uh, always teach how to code. Um, also, just I think it's actually people have developed great software that makes it so easy, especially people here at MIT um, with with the jump and um, a lot of people involved with that. I don't want to miss anyone and name them, but. Um, and even in, at the MBA level, I think, uh, I actually don't know how it works here uh, exactly, but um, I think at the MBA level, it should even be taught how to code and optimization. At Columbia, for example, we currently do things through Excel. And I think even that should be progressed to like some more real um, system that would be used in the real world. So the plus just, plus a requirement for MBAs. <laughs> I don't know, I, I don't know about that, but uh, the software is actually not too bad, and just exposing them to how easy it is would make it more likely to, to use it in practice. So. Asu? I think, absolutely, yeah, but there's a fine balance also. I think if you make it a lot of, you know, completely focused on computing, students also push back on that. We see it in, you know, machine learning classes, which are very heavily uh, computing focused. I feel like in optimization, there's a nice balance between, you know, focusing on theory and supplementing with the right level of, you know, data as well as computational like, exercises. Other questions or comments? Why is it that in machine learning, I guess I heard it pushed back, but most of the classes in machine learning actually are heavily computational and people still take them. I know, but I see, I hear sort of so much uh, sort of uh, comments about how much time they spend on uh, the computational aspects of it and not go deep into theory on some aspects. So I think there's a fine balance. I, I really like the idea of computational, but it shouldn't preclude us from going deep in the theory, at least on the relevant parts, if I may, you know. I know I see some students here. Gotcha. Yeah, if, if you want to encourage uh, use of data, I think one of the flaws that we have as a community is that each paper is developing their own ad hoc data set to test the algorithm on, and it's very, very hard to create a, a uniform set of metrics. And to what extent as a community, um, and, and to what extent um, having more joint uh, community-based data sets that can be uh, used to test uh, over a long period of time, various uh, advancements or algorithms uh, can be another vehicle to uh, not only uh, expand the research, the computation-driven research, but also maybe uh, uh, increase the, uh, the rate by which we uh, incorporate new ideas. I think uh, clearly it is very important. Um, you should, if you look at other scientific communities like in physics or chemistry and so on, they have long had uh, uh, databases of uh, data for experiments and so on. They understand the importance of, of what you say. In award, it has been not quite so much, right? Uh, even in, in, in engineering, in, in power engineering, only now, after many decades of pushback, uh, are people creating uh, publicly available data sets that are, that are serious and relevant uh, but sure, it would help a lot to have them there, uh, standard data sets that everybody refers to and so on. Yes, of course. Agreement? About that, so I guess there's a, uh, I was thinking about like, what, what is the difference between MIPLID and a data set? So, so it's like, the, we, do we, have, we, do, we do have libraries of optimization codes. Yeah. We don't have libraries of data sets. So is it that, why is it the machine learning can get libraries of data sets that are not so clearly tied to the problem, but in optimization we kind of tie to a model. We don't, we don't look at the, and you even lose the data, you have a middle of the problem and you have no idea where it came from. Maybe there's a small line that says the name of the contributor, but then what, what were they solving? Were they, they writing the problem the right way and we don't have access to the original data? Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on why that's happening in the war? Um. As to why it happened, I think probably, I mean, I would agree with you that those were bad decisions made a long time ago by people focused on perhaps excessively narrow definitions of what their research should be. You know, we should work on this problem and only this problem. Uh, but I agree, yes, data would be, of course, you cannot have just data. You have to have data and a description, you know, what, is, what it is that the data is and what is it that people are trying to do. But sure, yes. Um, I should add that for these uh, uh, power engineering problems, they are going the data way, not the formulation way, which is good. Yes. Les? The best teams of, the best teams of uh, 
software and, and great chess players do better than the best chess players as well as the best <coughs> software that plays chess. Mm -hmm. Is this like a singular point with optimization, or do you think it's a more general importance? It should, should opt if you're trying to optimize, do you believe that the algorithms and people should be teaming more, and how might that be done, and what's the impact of that on curriculum? To your question. Mm. Yeah. Asu? Asu? I think that's a single uh, data point. I mean, if you're thinking about just the zero-sum game uh, with uh, you know play, two players taking place, the type of questions we are basically looking at involve very large-scale interactions, at least the ones that I was talking about. And they're definitely an understanding of how humans, human objectives coupled with optimization and algorithms pl will play an important role moving forward to be able to create systematic understanding of these systems. It's sort of very large scale, so coming up with some systematic insights would be greatly helpful. And there I strongly believe in models, models working hand in hand with uh, data uh, as well as you know, algorithms. So I feel like you know, the focus on sort of playing chess or others are a little different from the, the type of problems I'm talking about. Anything to add? Um, um, so if I heard uh, some of what you said correctly, I think you were, you were saying something like in optimization, usually it's been a, a, small, per, a small team or a person developing an algorithm and a grandmaster working with a chess program will, will offer insights that the software itself won't have. So it's that the, there's parts of the problem that your optimization will miss, but the, the decision uh -huh. maker will be able to enhance that, uh, that optimization. Mm -hmm. I think, well, I think what you're addressing is also a byproduct of what the historical definition of what optimization is. How narrowly do you identify optimization? It ties with the previous question. Do you mean by optimization the uh, process of solving a very precisely defined mathematical problem that somebody else has identified and written down for you? Or do you mean something broader, you know, that you're using good mathematics, incisive mathematics to address a, a problem, right? These are two different things. So the uh, chess master working with other people to craft something that is successful, that is not the, uh, the, the nerd working on a very narrowly defined mathematical problem. These are two different facets. Now, both of them can be valuable, right? Uh, I'm not saying that one should be scuttled in favor of the other. They just give you different things. I, I also have a question following up. If you look at the, at least in my view, one of the principal developments in optimization in the last 30 years is the development of commercial algorithms, uh, Ciplex, Gurobi, Express in the past, that has really propelled the field forward. Uh, if you look at the develop, these are proprietary algorithms that only a very group of small group of people, the, the developers, can, can significantly contribute in that. The rest of us write papers, perhaps they take some of these ideas. In, in contrast, if you look at the machine learning community, they have developed publicly available codes where many people contributed. Mm -hmm. a, a good example of that is XEBoost. I'm not an admirer. It's, this is a, an algorithm for uh, prediction based on trees, adaptive trees methodology. The specifics are not important. But the key here is I'm not an admirer of codes, but it's a piece of code that I have read and understood a portion of it. It is something to admire. It's the, it's the collective knowledge of people that contributed. And, and, and the case was that the net output is better than the sum of its inputs. So this is two different developments. I would argue that uh, machine learning had serious adoption in the world. I wonder to the, the degree to which this model was used. I'm curious about your ideas about how to disseminate algorithmic developments mm -hmm. Uh, to the world in a way that would be more conducive to other people participating and contributing, and in the end, improving? It's not an easy question. Mm -hmm. no. yes, but I know you have thought about it. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Um, even just as a motivation for research, sometimes I even wonder, like, okay, if, I, if my algorithms need to use Grobe or Cplex, then only rich companies can use this. And, like, what about small businesses that can't afford this? So. As a researcher, you always want to be doing good, not just for big companies, but for anyone, right? So um, 
it'd be nice if everything was open source. And I think uh, a lot of us um, don't didn't have a formal training in in doing developing open source or even coding in um, robust uh, code. But I think um, I think if journals like impose some kind of more requirements or just force people to do it, many people can actually do it. They just don't want to, yep. even if it's for their own good. So I I would be in favor of like. Uh, Having just formal requirements that if you're proposing computational algorithms, just that you have to open source it in some form. I know, Dan, you have thought about it <laughs> <laughs> over um, decades. Th this is a, a very difficult issue for the community for a number of reasons, um, some of which are historical and perhaps maybe going away. There's still a substantial bias in the optimization community against computational work, as you're probably aware. Um, and that diminishes the appeal on uh, younger faculty to work on this. There, there is also the issue of funding, publication, and so on. Uh, all, all, all of these are challenges. Uh, developing a, a world-winning code, let's say, for linear programming today would entail many years of effort. Um, uh, Decades. Something that beats the solvers would take several years. It could be done. Uh, the solvers are not perfect. Uh, but um, it's very difficult to build a career where the timeline is like this. It would be good if, if there were more of an experimental component to the um, optimization community. Uh, um, experimental communities publish in a very different way. If you look at, again, physics and chemistry, uh, uh, these are serious, they have a serious experimental component. Uh, they have their own journals. They publish many short papers with many co-authors. Uh, if you tell them that this is an indicator of poor research quality, they will laugh at you. You know, they will open their closet and show you their Nobel Prizes uh, and say, what? Uh, you're telling me. Um, and so as such a perspective should be developed and the optimization community. I've been arguing for this for a long time. Um, historically, it has been very hard, it, and it's not going to happen anytime soon. Um, from the perspective of reporting, of course, there are, there's at least one journal that asks people to submit software for review. Um, um, uh, the interesting part is that uh, many of the authors who submit and who get their papers accepted, and so they have their software reviewed by uh, referees, they are not in favor of making their software publicly available, even after acceptance. You know, they, they grudgingly uh, accept that somebody will look at it for the purpose of reviewing it, but they want it to be taken away immediately. Uh, they just don't want it there. So uh, it's a very s slowly evolving uh, um, uh, psyche <laughs> uh, on the part of the optimization community that to some extent is a little behind the times with regards to uh, experimental work. Uh, Mitch? Yeah, I actually want to uh, push us back a little bit to the first question you asked about the current state of education. Just um, ask you a question. Um, at the risk of being viewed as a Luddite, which is not something I've typically been pushed into a corner, you know, I love the education I got when I was the first year of OR student, except for one guy who made me pivot tables do by hand and get really into understanding why, how linear programming works. But you, know, you, talk about, uh, you, know, but you talk about extra rules, and you talk about a lot of these algorithms, and I get to work with hundreds of very good data scientists from a very broad spectrum of, of industries and companies and so on. But there's something that's, that you can slowly see has been disappearing in the last 30 years, which is an intuition. And especially when I go in and I, I, I ask the team what they just did, and they said, well, we used the Python XG boost algorithm. They have no idea, really, what it's doing. And so, you know, one of the things I question is, are we moving, and, and look, I understand the speed that some of these tools give you, but I do question you to the point of the optimization education. Are we moving too far away from the fundamentals that really get and build intuition? I mean, are you seeing students have less intuition than they had, let's say, 20 years ago. Because I think that's where real innovation in the future is going to come from. And I just uh, to see if you have any perspective on that. I mean, having taught over 30 years, I haven't seen that. I think our, our current students uh, have sizable intuition as much as 10 years ago, 20 years ago, if not more. 
I have not seen, at least at MIT, which is my entire career, uh -huh. of any difference in that respect, Mitch. <laughs> I, was, I was young and inexperienced. <laughs> Softwares that are going to be open source and people are going to use and run on about optimization. We are hoping you. The the discussion was like we need this open source so that people actually see the software and see all these things and see and use them. Uh, but on the other hand, the discussion on education was like we should stick to fundamentals. We shouldn't make them code. So if we don't teach our our, our students to code and actually develop high quality software, then how do we expect our community to be the one developing the software? Well, the I have, I, I give you a concrete example of something I face next semester. Next semester I teach a class on robust optimization. I had a student here, Ian Duning, many of you know, who was a world-class uh, uh, scientist and engineer, particularly on creating software of high quality, is one of the authors of JUMP. So he created an extension of JUMP to robust optimization. Since then he has left, and uh, the, I have the code, but uh, uh, the, the Julia version changed uh, and so forth. So we now have in my hands a software that only works with the previous version and the only way I know how to create it compatible, I could use the older version, not the... So maintaining codes is tougher for universities. It, that is, how to exactly do it, I'm not familiar with. So I'm in interested in your views on this collectively. But, but this is not a minor point, because universities are good for prototyping things, new ideas, finding, but maintaining things, what am I going to say to my, student, to my next doc doctoral student, maintain a code that somebody else wrote, is inappropriate. So uh, I'm struggling with this. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm curious for ideas on the subject. It definitely affect the class, the class next semester, by the way. <laughs> Dan, you have yes. developed codes yeah, many yeah, yeah, years, yeah. many times. What do, you, what do you think? How did you do it? I'm, uh, I'm trying to uh, dodge the question. I know. And, uh, <laughs> you have been looking at me. Um, I'm trying to borrow ideas from other, other engineering domains. Um, I'm thinking, so I, this is just out of uh, pure intellectual interest, uh, but because it is uh, related, at uh, how... Uh, uh, Aerospace companies develop new engines and how car companies develop new engines as well. Uh, these are always very complex, very, very complex undertakings. Companies uh, will develop this, not universities. Companies, companies, correct, correct. Uh, so that's part of the point. Um, uh, they typically have surprisingly sl small teams doing the uh, most uh, crucial development. And often they, there may be one or two people who are actually responsible for the primary design. Um, and then, of course, the lower details get dispersed. Uh, and you have efforts that last several decades altogether until this engine is finally superseded by something new. Uh, now, as to how this happens at a university, um, I don't think that, so the, 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 the developmental work is not being done at universities, I, but I suspect that some of the faculty understand some of the designs and they, this is exposed to the students. Uh, there may actually be coding that they do uh, in this process. Um, I think it is expected that the students know how to code to begin with. And... Uh, um, uh, in their coursework, as it were, they're expected to do it regularly. And this way it happens, uh, and the skill sets are preserved. Um, software is a unique animal for the reason that you described, that you know you develop something that uses a library, and you, you wait two years, and now it doesn't work Changes. anymore. Uh, this is probably bad software engineering um, to some extent. There's a perhaps extensive reliance on these libraries that come and go. Um, yep. That uh, is a separate animal. But just to add on, maybe, I wonder if it's because of the journal uh, yeah. uh, culture that we have. It takes two years to publish, you know, uh, it's clear what the guidelines or, you know, uh, what are the metrics there. I wonder if your idea of, you know, having conference proceedings with focus areas would sort of help in some of these Pushing something like in the integer forward. programming area, there yes. is a conference like that. ITCO yes, it has is very similar along the lines of the theoretical computer science. Has this worked well in that respect, uh, Dan? 
Um, so I know you have been involved. All right, EPCO, okay, let, let me start with the, the good news about EPCO. Maybe leave first. it there. Uh, there has been a, a positive development with regards to EPCO that just happened a few months ago. EPCO used to be held only two out of every three years, uh, uh, thereby hobbling the conference. If you had a result in the wrong year, well, uh, but now it, it's been uh, uh, changed. Now it's going to happen every year, okay. Um, uh, IPCO is also a marriage of several communities, you know, uh, the, uh, to some extent, the uh, theoretical computer science community on the one hand and the integer programming community on the other hand. And within the integer programming community, only a subset was actually doing computation. So that if you were doing computational work and you submitted to IPCO, uh, it was quite possible that none of the committee members were in tune with us. Uh, so it didn't work. So this is, uh, 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 people are trying to address this now. Um, so. It would be good if there were two IPCOs every year, maybe IPCO and something else, and maybe the other one was more focused on computation. Uh, yes. So progress in the right direction, but not as much as Not as like. much yeah. as I would like, yes. So given that it is above three, let's uh, thank the speakers. Thank you. Oh.